We have Dr. Hazem El Bayrouti. I know guys, if you know him, he's a consultant in Germany. He has a great experience. Um, he's a cardiac and vascular surgeon. Correct, Hazem? You can correct me. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Professor Sam. Mm -hmm. Good Hi, evening. Good evening, Professor Hazem. Ah, good evening, Professor. Also, <laughs> yeah. hello to Damascus. Dr. Ali also, Mana. Uh, type, oh, let's go start and space our time. Uh, who, Muhammad, you want to start? Yalla, bismillah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, a 70 year old white male presents to the emergency department with sudden onset of severe back pain. The pain is described as severe and constant with, without elevating or aggravating factor. He has never had been like this pain, this pain before. He denied chest pain, shortness of breath, or loss of consciousness. He denies any history of abdominal aortic aneurysm. His past medical history is significant for hypertension and COBD that requires home oxygen therapy. He had bilateral inguinal hernioropathy some years ago, but he had never uh, had any laparotomy. He had, uh, his vital sign yielded pulse at 90 beat per minute and blood pressure of 110 over 60 millimercury. His uh, appropriately uh, conservant and appears older than his stated age. He was without uh, abdominal tenderness or masses and no brewery were heard. However, his belly was slightly obese and the examination was difficult. He has, uh, he has bilaterally bulbable lower extremity pulses. <laughs> Uh, he just came with severe back pain. Yeah. But nothing else. And they make it really very difficult for you. They didn't give you any yes. that he may have any rhythm or rupture. He just have yeah. severe back pain. Actually, and they deny any history of abdominal aortic aneurysm. And the exam is normal. Yeah. He's stable. Yeah. Okay, let's see what's the question. Let's see what's the question here. What are the symptoms? You can go, Hamad. Okay, so what is the symptoms are considered the classic presentation, presenting triad for ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. Okay, okay. so... Uh, back pain. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, abdominal or back pain. Uh, uh, I know also syncope and pulsatile mass, like yeah. this is the most common. But yeah, uh, yeah. And, and they put it there, uh, like B. So there's a three trial here, back pain, hypertension, and pulsatile mass. Yeah. So hypertension give you yeah. syncope. Usually hypertension, I think syncope uh, demonstrate like he has severe hypertension and they get... Uh, yeah, but the real injury. trial is back pain, hypertension, oh. and pulsatile mass. This is usual. But syncope fit, yes. Because yeah. it's hypertension, you can have a yes. syncope. So this is not real. But why is they said no. that? Often you can, people, they come with this classic pictures. How many uh, percent? Yeah, what the percentage of people come? I think like, they have this symptom. I think, uh, yeah, thirty percent, not more than thirty. Yeah. thirty to fifty. It's about yeah. 50, 50 percent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of them they don't have the symptoms like these patients, you know. Yeah. So it's a nice if you have this symptom, but you cannot relate. You cannot say, oh, he has no hypertension, no vascular and he's not in ruptures, you know. So it's the mm. reason why they give a scenario, just let you know that not every time you have this trial, okay? Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next one. There's nothing here really to add. Uh, patient here. Uh, uh, but Sam, you want to take this one? Oh, you continue, Muhammad. There's nothing there. Go ahead, continue, Muhammad. Okay, sure. Second question. Uh, if the patient is considered to have ruptured aortic aneurysm, which of the following factors does not adversely contribute to the prognosis? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So A, diabetes, which is the correct answer, I think. Uh, oh. B, uh, serum creatinine, 1.8, it's high. So the patient, uh, the ki acute kidney injury or kidney injury is one of the contributing factor. 
age is uh, 75 years. Uh, yeah, older age, they contribute in the prognosis. Uh, Pre-operative blood pressure of 80 millimercury. I think, yeah, this, uh, this one also. Uh, E-syncope. So I'm with diabetes. Oh. I can have more than answer, by the way, but uh, yeah. what do you choose? In diabetes, as so you does not adversely uh, uh, contribute to the prognosis. But I know diabetes has no relation to the aortic aneurysm, but I don't know if it's really really affecting the prognosis or no. After no, that's all. Not. no, that's uh, not. So yeah, it's not affecting. Is that the CMKT, like renal failure or high yeah. creatinine? Uh, older age. Yeah, and presence of hypotension during the procedure. What else do you think and else? What other symptoms preoperative can increase or is? Uh, yeah, if the patient came with acute kidney injury, if he's very old age, if his blood pressure is not controlled, especially preoperative or intraoperative hypotension, presence of MI. MI, uh, correct. MI is yeah. a bad sign. Yeah. You know, also hemoglobin. If he came with hemoglobin like you know five six, also is a bad sign. You know, uh -huh. so you have to look at that. You know, and yeah. uh, what about intraoperative sign? You know, what the intraoperative risk factor, which would happen your surgery increase your mortality. A very long uh, clamping time. Okay. And severe more hypotension. Than how much, you know? More than huh? how long? How long? More, more than I think thirty minutes. 45. 45, okay. 45 minutes. More than that, it's increase your uh, mortality. mortality. What else? Uh, a, 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 a severe hypotension during the procedure. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and yeah. because the more you get subrenal clamp, you get a renal insufficiency and compromise the mm. kidney. The reason why, when you do a surgery, the first thing when you go there, what do you do? You want to clamp where? You when try you to get it. Uh, uh, the safer is infrarenal. If you cannot, no, no. you do it supraceliac, and you do your aneurysm. Then you get down. You do your uh, repair uh, like proximal. Then you clamp in the graft. Um, Hamad, you open um, the belly. Okay, this is what you're going yeah. to see. You have to be very clear. Okay, it's a practical mm. point. When she comes a rupture, you're going to open the belly. You're going to find a huge hematoma in the where the water is, a big aneurysm. Yeah. Are you telling me that you're going to go there, open this one, and looking for a farina to put a clam? No, I will do it infradiaphragmatic, subraceliac. Ah, okay. So right yeah. away you go to subraceliac. You don't waste your time yeah. to go because the moment you open the hematoma, you may lose the patient. Okay. Yeah. So the first thing you go and control subraceliac water. Mm. Correct? Yeah. And how do you control it? Where, how do you open it? You know how do that? You open the cross of over the liver and the, on the left side of the liver, you open the, cro or the cross from there and you ask the anesthetist to put NG tube and you try to uh, palpate by your hand the uh, aorta, you clamp it there. Correct. Just so infradiaphragmatic. Correct. So you, op you, you open the gastrohepatic ligament. This is very yeah. easy. This one you just cut, has no vessel, you just cut it, okay? Yeah. When yeah. you are you are in the lesser sac, and then you try yeah. to find the aorta. Why, yeah. why you need that? Why you need that? Why you just feel a pulse? Why you need the, the NG tube? You can feel the pulse? Sometimes you, if you cannot, or the blood pressure is very weak, you cannot feel the pulse. Correct. If you feel it, it's better. But if you didn't feel it, the NGT will make it very easier. Because really, if there's no pulse, the aorta and the uh, the esophagus they feel the same mm. you want to you don't want first to injure the esophagus because high mortality mm. and you don't want to clamp the esophagus you think clamping the work you know mm. yeah uh, but you have to open the crura because the crura is very thick around the aorta in this area so you have yeah. to cut it you know don't be afraid you have to cut to get the aorta if you try to mm. put your clamp and the crura is still there i think it's very hard to do it Yes. What do what you do if you cannot, like, for some reason, you cannot, you try, you cannot find the water and you can't clamp it? What other option? Okay. I don't want to go. To, uh, you can put intra-aortic uh, balloon. 
No, I'm talking you are in surgery now. I'm doing practical. Yeah, yeah. So the, the next best approach is through left thoracotomy. This is one. Or, uh, or you open the transverse mesocolon and you just uh, uh, clamp it there. I think this is you get a ghost. The hematoma will be in your face, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, uh, Muhammad, the easiest way mm. is just a sponge stick and you just compress mm. because, you know, the water is behind it is what the, the, the vertebra, right? Yeah, yeah. Just, and compress them both, compress the esophagus and, the, you know, mm. the uh, water. So you just push and compress, give your part, your, your, you know, your assistant to compress, you know, blindly. And mm -hmm. you can get control. You know, this is a desperate way. And fast way, you know, yeah. so the easiest way. I'll let uh, the other consultant give you some tricks also, maybe Dr. Ali or the Hazim, if you want to mention something in controlling the aorta. I think you, you mentioned all. So uh, it's a rapid uh, operation. You have to be very, very rapid in these cases. And uh, this is what you have to do. Yes. Um, but again, I mean, it's not easy really. I mean, it is easy when you have a pulse, like when you do a selective, yeah. pulse, it's very easy. But really when patient hypotensive and no pulse, you'd be surprised how difficult to find our water, you know? Because, yeah. so, right Ali? I mean, it's really become very difficult. No pulse, everything feels Right, easy. right. Yeah, it's right. So really, the, the empty tube will help you to get the esophagus away and just clamp anything behind it. And if you cannot, at least push the esophagus away and get a sponge stick and push. Again, we push with a, this is what we do uh, usually. We push with the sponge, uh, with the sponge stick. And then uh, there is a instrument, uh, a, uh, instrument that uh, compress the water. And so uh, it's like a hook, like uh, not the hook now. Uh, it compress the water. Uh, so, or you can compress it with anything or with the hand of the, your uh, assistant. It's not a problem. Okay. But the main thing in this case is to be very, very rapid to open and to put a clamp uh, as fast as possible. Right. So, Muhammad, after you put this clamp, what will be your next step? In your mind? So, uh, resuscitate the patient. Uh, if he was hypotension, I will ask the anesthesia to give him blood to prepare the patient better. Right. If, he's, if he become more stable, I'll, I'll go to the next uh, step, which is uh, going through the hematoma and trying to get, uh, uh, yeah, to get the aorta and to see the area of the rupture and to get uh, like proximal uh, uh, control. You're right, Hamad. I mean, after you clamp, I mean, but this is the resuscitation will be the anesthesia part, you know? Yeah. And you ask him, go and start. It. But mm. you like in your mind, the next step should be one. You need to move this clamp as soon as possible to inforenal. Yeah. Yes. You already have, you know, renal, you know, not used. Uh, you're still losing a lot of blood through the retro flow from the, you know, from cilia, clumber everywhere. So my next step to, to go to see, I need to move this clamp as soon as possible to a forino. So the mm -hmm. moment I clamp it above as an anesthesia, I'm going to go right away now, you know, open the, the what's the name, the hematoma, to mm. find the final award. Yeah. Most of the time, for some reason, you found it. I mean, rarely you, you see like a bad, you know, juxtarino. I mean, most of the time you find a nice award out there. Yeah. Uh, and then once you do that, then you move your clamp down, and you remove the supracilia clamp. And then, yes. you can, then you can stop. Then you can stop and do whatever you want. But I think you need to really to move this clamp as soon as possible to inferenals, you know? Sure. Because one of the reasons for risk factor for both of mortality is renal failure. This mm -hmm. increase that is significant, you know? And uh, so this is intraoperative. So you said intraoperative is a clamping. What else things? Intraoperative can affect your mortality during the surgery. Is the length of the procedure? Yes, the length of the procedure, yeah. Hours, then it's different. So you have to get as soon as possible. You see, 
When you go to the aneurysm repair with a rupture, your first priority get the patient alive off the table. You know what the, what the uh, mortality with the operative report repair for rupture aneurysm? Uh, on table, around 50%. Correct. So 50% mortality is high mortality. Yeah. So anything can decrease your mortality, you have to take care of it. And the, one of them is to get the patient off the, because the longer the patient, the table, the hypothalamic, you go to DIC. So you don't need to do an, an, an excellent repair. You just need to fix him and get him off the table. What does that mean? Rarely we do bifurcated graft with the rupture aneurysms. Most of the time we just do a tuber graft. Even if you have a small iliac aneurysm, I will leave him alone, you know? You need to get the patient quick as possible, because I want to buy a film, go to the groin, do a bilateral iliac is all wrong. So most of the time, you just end with putting a tuber graft, you know, unless it's something like iliac rupture or the rupture from the iliac is different. But if the iliac is not involved, the best way, even the iliac that looks healthy, have stenosis, whatever, I think just to get off the table as soon as possible and put a tuber graft, okay? This is your, your bribe, that's very important. Uh, what else? Uh, uh, Dr. Samer, is there any role for Reboa? For what? Reboa. Yes, I'm talking In Reboa, you mean the intraortic balloon, right? Yes. Yeah, no, I'm talking now open repair. I'm not talking about, this is, we talked before we get him there. Yes, we're going to talk about data on, but I'm saying now, I'm going to give you like practical point during the surgery. You know, you decide to open what you do during the surgery, you know. You know, the surgery, you're not going to stop and put the balloon because you're already open, you're already clamped, so there's no need for balloon. This is you do before you open. But if you open, just go and put a, put a clamp. We need a, a balloon, you know? So on this okay. page, just go and put. But my, I'm trying to tell you that with open, with a rupture, try to get the patient off the table as soon as But the more, the longer he stay. So don't try to do uh, the right surgery. Just do a quick surgery, get him off the table, you know? Um, so try to decrease. And second thing, that what affect you using the cell saver is very important. We discussed that last time with a trauma. It decreases your uh, mortality because you know you use his patient blood. You know, using cell cell saver is very important. So we'll go back, Muhammad, with you again. So what about post op? What about post op risk factor can increase your your mortality? What complications can increase your mortality after surgery? I'm going to say this patient has high chance. Oh, okay. Uh, again, MI would like one of the top priorities. Uh, so infection, either graft infection or any oh, pneumonia. Um, after surgery. Uh, after surgery, in, in first 24 to 72 hours is the MI. Usually is the leading cause of death. Acute kidney, uh, acute kidney injury, renal failure also. The significant, yeah, yeah, and they they get like a, a double pulmonary uh, side effect, which is ended up by severe pneumonia sometimes. Yes, but I think this is the main things. Uh, this is correct, you know. Uh, some people they look if you have, I know this is very. If you have a three organ failure, your mortality hundred percent. So they look yes. at the three of, you know, risk factor. If you have more than three risk factors, some people they think the mortality hundred percent. You know, like patient comes with a renal failure and he has MI and rupture and hypotension, right? Yeah. And they think this is mortality hundred percent. Should not do anything. But the problem we don't have a guideline. We know that, but we don't have a guideline. We still ask. You have to make your decision according to your case by case discuss with the family. But if you have a three risk factor or more preoperative, most people they think it right, doesn't work to take into surgery, you know, because mortality almost had, you know. Uh, Ali, you want to add anything for interoperative like technique to help them? Uh, uh, I always um, try to say something about the acidosis, mm -hmm. it's, uh, the main enemy of, uh, uh, of us. So, acidosis, it's important to treat it during and after uh, the, uh, the operation. And the second thing, uh, uh, thing is to be very, very fast in these cases. Uh, I always repair uh, aorta, uh, aorta and iliac arteries uh, usually. Uh, you repair only the aorta. I always repair both. 
uh, this is my uh, uh, my way to do. So, um, but, but I think that to be fast in these things and uh, to know where you put your hands, it's the rare I think. I agree with you, Ali. What, what I meant, of course, you're going to make the decision the table. The patient is really stable and you are doing fine, but the patient is stable. Yes, yes, you can do a different procedure, no question. But I'm saying is that if patient really is hypotensive and, you know, and cold, and you can't catch up with the pressure and lost blood, I think the quicker you get them off, it'll be better. But yes, I mean, you can do it if you have a time and patient stable. But don't try to do the perfect surgery and patient is not stable. This I'm trying to say, you know. Let me go over the AMI and the AMI and the AMI and the AMI and the AMI. Hazim, you want to add anything? Ah, Martin is here also. Hi, Martin. Hey, guys. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Martin. Yeah, I'm driving. I'm driving from the hospital. Oh, okay. Uh, I really enjoying it's uh everything you said is valid uh it's just you know i i, I get your point of like getting patient out it means you don't do any complex reconstruction you want to stop bleeding and keep the uh, blood circulating distally uh but you know the moving the moving clamp from beneath the diaphragm to the infrarenal uh the most important is to not get into another complication and then that's much more important than anything else uh you know for younger surgeons it's uh it doesn't mean you need to really rush with like you know reclamping because if you if you don't have like you know if you don't have a good space down there and you tear like ivc or lumbar artery then you are in a bigger trouble than before uh, because like, you know, 15 minutes doesn't really matter. I've never seen like, you know, you know shut down just because of 15 minutes of, of delay of, of the reclamping. So be, be safe is perhaps the most important. And then from the technical point of view, when you deal with this, uh, with these cases, don't play around with like five zero proline small needles, get, get to, Two zero proline, big needle, big bites, and plunge it, and and do it as fast as, as you can. That's that's my advice. Okay. But I really enjoyed the, I really enjoyed the, the discussion, guys. Thank you, my Martin. I agree with that. Uh, one of the things can increase your interruptive also, you know, mortality, as Martin said, is uh, other complications during the spectrum, like if we injure the renal vein, you know. As I said, if he has a retro, like retro aortic renal vein, you damage or you damage the IVs, they're going to rush. Yes, because then you have a lot, especially the vein, you have a lot of blood loss. And this will increase your mortality. So yes, you have to speed, but you have to be wise, as Martin said, because speed doesn't mean, because if you injure anything by speed, then you lose really the benefit of that. So you have to be careful. Uh, but yeah, because any injury to any organ during the procedure to prolong your procedure increase your mortality. All right, uh, let's go to Bassam. Bassam, you want to take third question? Uh, I have, Professor Sam, I have only uh, uh, sorry, one please. thing. Um, it's about communication with the, with the anesthetist. It's very important uh, for me. Um, I said always, um, uh, actually, and the most of times we got a rupture at uh, mid of night. So, and um, I don't have, uh, uh, or in lots of cases, I have only a resident anesthetists. So the first of all, I try always to, uh, to talk to my anesthetist and to tell him, to tell him that before clamping, please don't give any blood products before clamping, aortic clamping, because it's wasting of products, first of all. Second, we don't need a blood pressure of more uh, like 120, 160, 140. Please uh, leave uh, the middle blood pressure should be at the minimum. I think with 50, 60 millimeter, it's enough for me. And uh, second, if um, and third point, after releasing my clamping or our uh, uh, diaphragma clamping, try not to remove the clamping. 
it means uh, reclamp supra or infrarenal and release the clamping in, in, in intra infradiaphragmatic region, but leave it in, seat, in situ in case of reclamping. It's very important. And in case of, uh, of tampon, so I use also to press the aorta, but after that, if it's not uh, possible to, to clamp the aorta, but after that, I go directly to the thoracic aorta and uh, clamping through, uh, through uh, left mini thoracotomy. Thank you, Hazem. Your point is very well taken. It's a very nice point, and I agree with all of them. Uh, yes, communicate with the anesthesia is very important. And I always turn the monitor so I can see the monitor. And it's very important to communicate because the anesthesia has to know what's going on, you know, especially when you clamp and unclamp. So before I unclamp, I told them the anesthesia, I'm going to unclamp. So he prepared, he fill up the patient. And many times I do partial unclamping because if you clamp completely, unclamp, he will lose the hyper, he becomes, we go to hypotension, you know. So it's very important. Second thing, as Ali mentioned, acidosis. So before I, so I clamp, I tell the anesthesia, we're going to re-perfuse the legs. We're going to get, you know, acidosis to so prepare for that. So yes, 100% uh, correct. Three, uh, communication with the anesthesia, get the patient off of the procedure. But if you work alone and he work alone, you never get the patient off the table. 100% I agree with that, yeah. All right, um, let's go to question number three. Sam? Okay. Uh, the, the... Uh, let's continue. Patient EEG showed this. Yeah. Patient ECG shows normal sinus rhythm. The creatinine was 1.7 and the hematocrit was 32%. He remains hemodynamically stable. Your resident feels he is stable enough for a computed tomography. Okay. Uh, Which one is to, yeah. Which of the following statements is true? Patients uh, with unknown history, uh, triple A history and symptoms should undergo further diagnostic uh, imaging if they are hemodynamically stable. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, does the hair CT? No, CT, I'm talking about CT. CT, yeah. If the patient is stable enough, yeah, he should go for uh, CT yes. and Whatever, it's like patient comes to the ER and you suspect he has rupture aneurysm, whatever. But you don't know his history of aneurysm, but he's stable. You can yeah, see him. It's better, it's better to take him to uh, to CT, just to, to, يعني, to be ready which side, which, uh, at Correct. which level the aneurysm is there. So it's better to diagnose before. This is correct. Well, next one. Yeah. Symptomatic uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm should undergo emergency repair to prevent possible rupture. Yeah, sure. This is correct. Uh -huh. Symptomatic it's, trouble. Be watching for uh, emergency. Yeah. Symptomatic. But, yeah, they, we'll take, they but also we need to do CT angio. We yes. need to confirm the diagnosis. So you should not rush into surgery without uh, without CT scan. Right? Yeah. And and symptomatic, I don't know if they mean rupture or just you know, symptoms. Uh, really this question is vague, you know. Uh, uh, let's go. Yeah, patients with it, it means uh, means pain only. I think uh, Samir. This is wrong. And he has a back pain mm -hmm. only and the pulsatile mass uh, and not hypotension. I think this is what he meant with the symptomatic AA. And not uh, not ruptured, not already ruptured. So this doesn't need an emergency. It need an urgent, but not an emergency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's wrong. Next one. Uh, patients with uh, an unknown triple uh, A history must have diagnostic imaging confirmation of an triple uh, A before proceeding to the operating theater. Yes. Uh, hmm. Yeah, it is correct. Unknown uh, history. You see, you see. it's better to get uh, imaging to confirm the diagnosis if the patient is stable. Well, Here what did they you did not mention. Yeah, right. What did you say, Bassam? You said it's better, right? Yeah. What they said in the question, they said must. They see said must. 
So I think this is uh, the issue. You cannot say must. Yeah. Because if patient comes, even with unknown trouble, like and hypertensive back pain, you know, and I mean, it's, it's a controversial, you know, and then you do a quick, you know, EKG, because the only thing can cause that it could be cardiogenic shock and he's in shock. Could be hemorrhagic shock or cardio, but if his hemoglobin is low, EKG is normal, and he's unstable, most people take him to the surgery right away. Um, yeah. I think these days, the improvement of quick ultrasound, everything's, I don't think it's a practical uh, because it's very easy to get an ultrasound very quick, even CT scan. Yeah. By the time you get anyway or prepared, you know, you can yeah. get a, a CT. So really, this is a question maybe for exam, but in practical life, um, I think always you can get kind of images, you know, by the time get the anesthesia to see the patient, get the blood ready, a quick, you know, uh, ultrasound. You see, the ultrasound will not help you. And is it good for, for aneurysm, for diagnosis, ultrasound? It can give you a hint. Yes, there is uh, aneurysmal dilatation. What about rupture? Um, yeah, I mean, not accurate. It can be, yeah, it is not accurate, yes. About only 45% can give you a rupture, really. So sometimes it's very difficult, you know. But for aneurysm, it's 100%. You can see a swelling. I mean, aneurysm yeah. dilated. So for diagnosis and aneurysm, then you say, okay, as an aneurysm, hypertensive blood pressure down, then you said you take him. But if patient is stable and you need really to confirm the rupture or to plan you, then you have to get a CT scan, you know. But just yes. to take him with unknown trouble A and just because hypertensive and because it could be cardiac, you know, and take him to surgery without any images. I think the old fashioned, they said, yes, it's unstable, but nowadays I think you need sub images. Uh, I love to hear from the other guys, from Martin, from Ali, from Hazim. What do you think about this one? Would take a patient right away to surgery? Who begins? Ali, you want to answer Ali? What do you think? Uh, regarding the ruptured aneurysm, aneurysm or triple A, I think something that we have to say. If the aneurysm is ruptured, uh, retroperitoneal, then you will have uh, a, a period of uh, hypotension, then the patient will be stable for a moment. So you can do what you have to do. Uh, the problem is to give contrast or not. This is the problem, depends on the creatinine of the patient and the renal function. Uh, the other issue that we search in these patients is the neck if the aneurysm has an, a good neck or not. This is our problem as surgeons. I think for me, uh, I always uh, search for the neck if it is, if he has a good uh, neck or not. If the aneurysm is ruptured intraperitoneally or in the cava or in, in other, in the intestinal loops, uh, this is a problem. I think you will not have so many time to, to do what you have to do. Retroperitoneal uh, rupture, usually gives you uh, uh, time to, to make some uh, diagnostic uh, uh, exams, I think. So my question, Ali, for you is that patient has no history of trouble A, come to the ER, hypertensive, severe back pain, and um, syncope, as you said, you know? And do you think he may have we, 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 we go uh, directly to the OR. Even without, do you know when he has a trouble A? He has no history uh, of trouble A. You have, uh, when you put the, the, uh, the hands on the abdomen, I think you will, uh, you will know that he has uh, aneurysm. Don't feel a mass. Make it, give you a scenario for the junior, you know. Yeah. Uh, it could be cardiogenic shock, could be a cardiac, it may have MI, could be hypertensive, and you know, and uh, or could be maybe like Usually, could these be patients, how would you know? Hematoma could be expanding oh. the hematoma. Oh, yes. So, I think days, um, I don't know, I mean, you have to look at the scenarios, but this is always an, an issue when patient is unstable, but I still think. I think in my opinion, if he's unstable to at least get an images 
to get at least like an ultrasound or quick CT scan, like in a hospital, which you can do it like in 10 minutes, like in not two hours. You cannot survive this one. I don't think you can survive the war. This is my, my the way I look at that. If you cannot survive this like 10 extra, I don't think you can survive for the war, maybe you die on the table. Uh, and especially now these days, we know that EVAR is better than open repair. Also, this can give you an image to go and you know, put, you know, do an EVAR or put intraortic balloon pump if you know your diagnosis. Um, so I think maybe for the exam, they still said unstable patient, they kept the war, but I still think you need some images. Hazim, what do you think, Hazim? You see a lot of rupture in your resume? Yes, sir. Um, actually, for me, I will stay always, uh, or I will try always to be at the safe side. It's not only about, I'm not talking about, not only about the, the plan of the procedure of which art of, uh, uh, or which uh, side of clamping. I am talking, as you said, sir, about which art of surgery, if endo or, 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 or open, because if I am going to, to, to apply the endovascular surgery, I need, I need to get a, a plan and I need the CT to get a measurement and to put my monoiliac side, mono aortoiliac uh, uh, so stand. So I think, um, and as you said, sir, if, if the patient is not able to survive this couple minutes to get a CT, I don't think he will be able to survive uh, uh, to prepare the aorta. And don't forget, in the in the CT, there is in the CT room. There is also a possibility, as said one uh, also one uh, doctor, um, that is possibility also to to apply the intra aortic uh, uh, balloon. Uh, uh, um, uh, balloon and this uh, with this. Yeah, yeah uh, inf uh, infradiaphragmatical or, yeah. or, or in intra uh, aortic in in uh, in uh, thoracic part, and this will uh, give us also uh, enough time to to transfer the patient to ER, uh, to operation room. So I will take uh, and I will stay at the safe side. I agree with you, uh, Hazim. Yes, you agree with that. You can put the even in the in the ER. You can put the balloon. Our pathway now. Uh, we have a pathway for rupture aneurysm if you come to the, our hospital. If patient is stable, uh, of course, he has to go for CT scan. Uh, I don't think is that I agree with Ali is renal function could be a problem, but here is a life, you know, patient life, you know, on the, on the, is an issue. And going CAT scan with the country is very important because I can do an EVAR or versus open, so it make a difference. So even if the kidney is not good, I think I'll give him a contrast because I need to save the patient life first things, you know, they can deal with the kidney. Uh, if patient unstable, usually we call the OR, we get, we call the OR, we call the anesthesia. And the, in our way to the OR, we go to the, so we don't go from ER to CT scan to ER to OR. No, we go ER, CT scan, OR, you see. So in our way to the OR, we, we pass by the CAT scan. We CAT scan, then 15 minutes, and then we go to the OR. By the time we get patient on the table, we have the images and then we'll decide. So this is our protocol, you know, this is the way we do it. Uh, I don't know if Martin want to add anything, Martin. No, it's, uh, I totally agree with you guys. I would definitely go for CT. It, it depends on the local circumstances, you know, each hospital is different. Yes. Like in our, in our hospital, CT is at the front of ER. It takes, you know, if I'm there, you know, if I push it myself, it takes like 12 minutes to do the CT. I would definitely go for imaging. No, not only for confirming the diagnosis, I can do the ultrasound myself and I see the aneurysm, but as it was said, you can decide about open uh, endovascular, you see the retroaortic renal vein, you know, many things uh, which can change your plan and the surgical strategies. I definitely vote for the imaging before, unless patient is really critical. But as you said, I've seen it many times, if patient cannot wait 15 minutes, he won't make it anyway. That's so this, this is for the please for junior uh, people. This is in a hospital where, as we said, all of us we can do CAT scan quick. But if your CAT scan takes like half an hour, then don't do it. No, take him to the ward. Otherwise, you have a dead pay person. <laughs> we are talking about a setting where they are prepared for emergency rupture aneurysm. We can do CAT scan in 10, 15 minutes. But you are in the setting where the hospital takes you to get the intervention from the, his house to come in the middle of the night. It takes you an hour to get a CAT scan, then don't do it. No, go.
go to the war, open him up and climb him as soon as possible. Okay, Mr. Sam, uh, let's continue quick. Uh, number an ECG, yeah, <clears throat> an ECG demonstrating ischemic changes in a patient with epigastric pain, hypotension and tachycardia is the sign synqua non, uh, non for, um, uh, for myocardial infarction and any operation should be postponed. What is uh, telling you that if you have an EKG short ischemic changes, can you rule out <clears throat> aneurysm? No, cannot. Why not? Uh, it's, it could be secondary to the ruptured aneurysm to right. hypertension. All the ischemic changes could be secondary to hypertension and reperfusion. So even if yeah. you can't see any changes, you can see hundred percent no, it is MI, and you still have to rule out ruptured aneurysm. Okay, last one. CT scans are reserved for elective evaluation of triple A and have no place in the workup of symptomatic, of asymptomatic triple uh, A patient. No, okay. it can be done also in the emergency. We talk about just now. Yeah. All right, let's go to question four. Maybe Ahmed, want to take it, Ahmed? Yes, please. If an ultrasound, figure 4.2, was obtained instead of CT scan, which statements could be made regarding this study? Ultrasound is more reliable to scan for the diagnosis of rupture triple A. Not true. Uh, what what I think what we said before? How much the percentage of ultrasound diagnosed rupture triple A? Uh, the the CT is ninety five percent sensitive. Okay. What about ultrasound? For ultrasound, um, I don't remember exactly the percentage. For rupture, but, it's almost 95% for diagnosed triple A. You can see triple A. The diagnosed rupture is only 50%. Mm -hmm. So it's not very reliable. It's faster, but not reliable, you know? Okay. Next. But B, the location of the rupture is typical for most uh, ruptured triple A's. What is that? Location of the rupture is typical for most rupture triple A. Meaning mostly below infrarenal, that's what they mean? You're talking about the ultrasound. Maybe it's kind of difficult for most. I don't know, just let's skip it. Let's go to the next one. Ultrasound can be performed quickly at the bedside, that is true. Correct. Next. It is readily available. Ultrasound can be used to provide endograft measurements, not really. Okay. Uh, ultrasound is best used in an unstable patient to confirm the presence of known triple A. It can tell you if, but the patient when hypotensive, the, even the, the diameter will not be true. Let's say to confirm the presence of known trouble. And if he's known trouble A, then he is known. Ultrasound will help much. Not as the best, you know, as I said, only 50% can tell you is uh, rupture or not, you know? Mm. If patient is unknown triple A, then yes. If patient doesn't have any A and want to diagnose triple A, then this is a quick test you can do. So it is very good in an unstable patient with unknown of triple A. But unstable patient with known triple A, I don't think that trouble, the ultrasound, I mean, it can, it can help, there's no question, but I think be wasting time, be quicker to get a CAT scan because information from the ultrasound will not help you much. Uh, I still prefer to go do a quick uh, CAT scan, you know. Um, some people, uh, they do interactive angiogram CT scan for an unstable patient. They came to the war and do interactive angiogram. And they can use, if, but this is in a setting where they have a lot of stent available, different length. And uh, they do interactive angiogram. The problem is the measurement. Um, some people use an IVAS, but I don't think it's uh, suitable with uh, ruptures. Um, the only problem I have with, uh, with uh, angiogram, you can give you the links, but you cannot tell the diameter of the neck. Um, I know, Hazim, can you do it, measurement on angiogram only? Uh, I, actually, I can uh, talk about, uh, about uh, my planning. So, I uh, I take on, only the CT measurements. Um, I don't uh, uh, I don't trust the NGO uh, measurement, especially there is a new uh, uh, um, uh, 
program where you can uh, also um, uh, take a measurement according to to your balloon. Uh, per example, you can measure uh, from marked uh, from from uh, some point to another point as defined marked with uh, 10 uh, millimeter or, or, or one centimeter, per example. And according to this measurement, you can also apply and, uh, and also uh, take the measurement uh, 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 in while you are um, doing angiogram. But actually, um, I don't trust this method. Okay, the last question, let me ask you. Uh, the old fashioned we used to do for a quick rupture aneurysm, I wore to you know, iliac because very quick and do fem fem. Do you think still vial valid or now with our experience getting better, bifurcated is better to go with the bifurcated graft? Um, do you use our to iliac or bifurcated graft in rupture aneurysm? Um, as you know, it's, it's, it's actually a very, a very good question. Um, as you know, um, it's it's depending on the anatomy and depending uh, uh, on on your measurements, how long you have uh, uh, you have uh, uh, for for uh, uh, for landing zone and something uh, other. But but in case where I have um, to to uh, land, um, it's also sorry. It's also depending on who is gonna make the endovascular implantation of the stents. If you are enough experience and if you have en enough experience to, 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 uh, um, to get the contralateral limb and, uh, and to, to apply and to release the, the, the both iliac stents, and um, and not losing uh, a lot of time, go for uh, B iliac. But uh, for my residents, I, I I always try to tell them to apply only um, uh, uh, aorto iliac and doing fem fem bypass as as quickly and safe and um, and stress um, and not full stress operation. I agree with that, you know, I mean, especially if you don't have like enough, to, you know, like inventory, you know, because our DNA, you can get like five, six devices, that's all what you need and cable limb and be quick because sometimes can you actually control the limb could be really pain in the neck and patient, especially patient unstable. So this could be a quicker, you know, just what you need iliac and do, we have to, of course, include the contractor iliac and do fem fem bypass. So sometimes it could be a quicker. If patient is stable, if patient is stable, maybe you have more time. It depends also what you have, what your supplies are. But it's something you, you can think about it, yeah. All right, uh, don't take too much of your time, guys. Let's keep going. Uh, Ahmed, you want to continue? Yes, please. Uh, question number five. All of the following measures are indicated in the perioperative management of the ruptured triple A. Uh, you forgot here after the confirmation of uh, rupture. After the confirmation of rupture AAA by radiology, the patient is taken immediately to the operating theater. That's the case. Okay. All of the following measures are indicated in the preoperative management of a rupture AAA, except okay. surgical preparation and rape before induction. Correct. It is correct. Uh, if there is time, yes. If not, I know what is ART telling. They tell you that. When patient gets to the OR, what usually we do? Usually the anesthesia start and then we prep, right? Yes. In the rupture, I'm telling you, you should do the opposite. You prep and drape, and then you tell the anesthesia to start. This is correct? You do the opposite. And why? Uh, because it's the time to, to clamp, to put your clamp. So what, what anesthesia does, you have to tell them something very important when they intubate this patient. How do you intubate the patient? You know how the, the intubation done? What do they do to intubate the You mean the muscle relaxant? Correct. So if you have muscle relaxant, what happened? You lose your tamponade. Yes. You can convert container rupture to free rupture and patient right die on the table, you know? So what happened is that you prep and you're ready. Then you ask him to, to because something happened, you're ready, but the start intubation and patient rupture, by the time you prep the patient and you, you know, prep him and drape him, you lose five minutes, you can lose the patient. You see my point? So the, mm -hmm. the rupture is the only case we do the opposite. 
We prep the abdomen, we drape, we even scrub, everyone scrub. And then we ask the anesthesia. If you want to ask anesthesia to do it, even without muscle relaxing, if they can. But if they cannot, they must relax. If something happened, the knife is a knife in your hand. You can just open the abdomen right away in two minutes and you come down with them. Unless if you have, of course, another option to do, as we mentioned before now, these days to do an intraortic balloon, you know, before induction to anesthesia. But the whole idea, before induction to anesthesia, you have to be ready because they can, you can lose them when they give muscle relaxant. Okay? So okay. this is correct. Uh, B, preoperative pre resuscitation to normal blood pressure. No, actually keep them on permissive hypotension. Correct. And as I mentioned, that is very important. So you don't want pressure more than 100. So 80, 90 is more than enough. You don't need high pressure to increase your bleeding. Okay. C, passive cooling of the patient. These patients are usually hypothermic. You need to warm them up. Correct. The opposite. Why? Why? What's the cooling? Why? Cooling is good for the brain. So why is bad here? Uh, uh, it will cause um, uh, cutaneous vasoconstriction, will shift everything to the center. No, it's coagulopathy. Yeah, why well, not try it? Coagulopathy. And patient already coagulopathic, you know, so if it's cold, you increase your coagulopathy, increase your bleeding, you know. Okay, next one. Heparinization before cross clamping. This will precipitate in further bleeding. I would avoid it. Okay, and I'm going to ask other concern about hepatization now, but continue. What about the last one? Blood uh, re 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 recuperation and other transfusion. Yes, they, have, they must be prepared for okay. a transfusion and cell savers. Okay. So it's very important to keep the patient warm, ready to wrap it ready for surgery before the induct anesthesia. And again, you tell the anesthesia if they can intubate without muscle relax and be better so if they can. Because the moment you must relax and or what happened, you tell them don't give it. And after you open the belly and you climb the water, then you ask him to give muscle relaxant. But at least you have a control first. Uh, hypnotization, we don't give hypnotization until after we clamp. And most people, they just give it local, don't give systemic because patient already will be like, you know, in the IC. But I'd like to hear from uh, Martin, Ali, and Hazim, what do you think about hypnotization? Do you give it or you don't give it? In rupture it's a good question. I always give it. Okay. I give it, I give it with my clamp usually. Uh, oh. I've, I've learned this from Jacobs from Maastricht. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I remember he was doing elective elective uh, abdominal artery repair and he asked anesthetist for the heparin. They gave the bolus and he immediately clamped the aorta. I said like, I said like, Mark, you don't wait for like three minutes at least. And he said, it doesn't matter. Okay, yeah, but... so what I do with rapture, I, I always give some heparin because I've seen, I've seen opposition because in the rapture aneurysm, you never know how, how long it's going to get, you know. So uh, when, I, when I get the space for clamp and I put the clamp, I ask for, for 5,000 heparin. Yeah. So you give it after, not before, as I'm saying. So you give it after you clamp the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I give it after the clamp, after the clamping. Okay. Uh, okay, what about Ali? What do you think, Ali? Uh, I put the clamp I, uh, in place. I give heparin, then I close the clamp. Okay. All right. So, uh, totally yeah. agree, uh, but I, I, I try not to give uh, uh, full doses. Okay, just give some heparin, yeah. All right. So let's go back to Muhammad. So what happened? The patient's prepared and draped. Okay, let's continue. Oh, the patient is prepped and draped. The anesthetic, uh, the anesthetic administer and the operation command, uh, commenced. The medical student asked if they could done be if this could be uh, done via endovascular approach. I think in this situation I will not answer it. I'll be focusing, but yeah, yeah, there is role of uh, endovascular. Recently, I went through a paper with a. Uh, with a high uh, incidence of uh, uh, rupture aortic aneurysm, and they published very good paper about the, how they, this, their technique in, uh, in endovascular, and their result is almost what? as good as open. Which the improved also... trial shows it, Aslan. Yeah. What's the name of the trial? Improve. 
Improve. What it showed? Improve in, th in 30 days. And one year, the same mortality, same cost. But right. after three years, the, the, the survival is better within the vascular group. This is correct. So first year did not show, except for who? Except for... Uh, um, for women. I, yeah. 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 Uh, they consider them as a high risk for... They always, yeah. The high risk. So the women, they did better. They have better survival, but only for the woman within 30 days. So what are that? So what's the advantage of the EVA? If they say the same mortality, 30 days, one year? They are the, the complication of our wound infection, wound dehiscence, and this thing. Morbidity. Morbidity, uh, yeah. They found of early discharge, they can go home earlier. And the yeah. quality of life is better already. They found even yeah. the mortality is the same, but the quality of life is better, you know? Mm. So quality of life is better and discharge, even the cost is much less than, not much less, but it's lower than the open repair. Because yeah. open repair. They, compare, they compare the length of stay with the cost of the stent. So yeah. they saw the same. And then after three years short improved mortality. So really it improved quality of life, improve your early discharge, less, you know, uh, cost. And after three years, you show better mortality. So the reason why now the recommendation uh, is to do an EVAR for rupture aneurysm if patient is stable and you have the equipment to do it, you know? Yeah. Well, well, most summit, important is the facility. Uh, Martin, yes, Martin. Yeah, let me just make a comment because I know about this. It's This applies only for the centers. They have a specialized endovascular rupture aneurysm uh, protocols because for this, you need a whole lenses and the whole, you know, portfolio of the stent grafts available. It's not, and, and everyone needs to know what, what to do. This, this doesn't apply for the hospitals. They do just randomly, you know, EVAR because this, this is completely different playground than, than plant EVAR when you have like a lot of time and you can bring whatever you need. This is it, for, for, for rupture aneurysm, you need everything on shelf. You cannot just improvise, you know. Uh, Martin, let me ask you a question, Martin. Did anybody answer this question? What is better is in a hospital where you don't have equipment for EVAR and patient has rupture aneurysm and stable. Is it safer to transfer him to a, a, a hospital where they have uh, equipment to do an endovascular or is it better to do an, an open repair on this patient? I would go for open repair. I think yeah. that, that's, that's my personal opinion. I, yeah. if, if in this place, I would go for open repair and I believe the, the outcome will be the best. Yeah. I Better agree. than transferring the patient. Uh, yeah, the center, even if it's stable, because you don't know when he becomes unstable. Yeah. Exactly. I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, Ali, you want to add anything or has him? But in the vascular repair? Uh, sorry, Professor Ali uh, should leave. Uh, he wrote, uh, sorry, I have to leave. Thanks. Okay. So has him. Um, um, here in Germany, actually, it depends, uh, as, uh, as Dr. Martin said, uh, about uh, in which center. Um, actually, in Germany, we are talking now uh, since a couple of years of aortic center. So um, there is a lot of hospital, they don't allow to, uh, to operate aorta more. Uh, um, open or endo. So um, it's very important, uh, the term uh, endovascular or aortic center. Um, I think it will be better for the patients and for the outcome, because you can offer the best way uh, to treat the patients, not, uh, not according uh, what you have. It's very important, this point. Okay, all right. Uh, who was doing this question? Mohammed, right? So let's go through the question. Yes, go sir. So currently, what what are the contraindications for uh, EVAR repair for rupture aortic uh, aneurysm? Okay. So first, infra uh, renal neck diameter more than thirty. This is actually a good feature. Good feature. Infra uh, the diameter, sorry, sorry, diameter, no, no, this is very big. Uh, I, I thought it's length. No, yeah. 30 is very big. And uh, 
and it consider as a colical neck or the aneurysmal neck. So you actually you don't have a neck. So for, yeah. uh, no. 28 really to get a good CV 28, you know, 30 yes. the limit, you know. Yeah. So more, not, yeah next more than 30, it's not good. Yeah. Uh, infrarenal neck length is less than 10 millimeter. No, you need at least more. Uh, nowadays, they said one to two. I yes. think one is the limit, but less than one is very difficult, especially right. in uh, rupture or aneurysm. So both A and B are contraindication. C, uh, systolic blood pressure is less than 100 millimercury. Blood pressure is not uh, has no role between uh, Right. Open or, uh, yeah. Okay, next. Okay, see, endograft or endograft team is not available. This is a contraindication to start. Okay. Uh, e thrombus present at infrarenal neck. I think you can proceed even with thrombus, it's not a contraindication. That's true. Most of the uh, short yeah. thrombus doesn't affect your really outcome. So, thrombus is not. Yeah. All right, yeah, so A, B, and C. Right. So let's take uh, uh, the question. But Sam, you want to take the last question? Can you continue? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the patient was determined to have too large uh, a neck diameter for, endovas for an endovascular stent. Too large the uh, neck diameter. OK. So you decided to proceed with an open repair. After induction, the patient's blood pressure falls to a systolic of 60. A supraceliac clamp is quickly placed and the aneurysm exposed. The rupture was contained uh, to the retroperitoneum, but is rather large. The supraceliac clamp is moved to an infrarenal position after about 10 minutes. Anesthesia quickly catch, catches up and his systolic blood pressure rises to 100. The inferior mesenteric uh, artery was not patent and the iliac arteries were without aneurysm, allowing a dacron tube graft to be placed. The clamp is slowly removed and remains hemodynamically stable. The bowel appears well perfused and distal pulses are palpable before closure. Postoperatively, the patient recovers in uh, the surgical intensive care unit. The most common complication following repair of ruptured uh, aneurysm is? Which one is the most common of the, all these one? Yeah, it's uh, aortoiliac fistula. It's common. It's, uh, it's documented, but it's not uh, really common. Bowel ischemia, yes. Mycardial ischemia, yes. Uh, atheroemboli, also, yes. Acute renal failure, yes. Yeah, so B, C, D, E, all. Ah, but which one is the most common? Which one the most common? Um, I would choose D, atheroemboli. Uh, but Sam, be practical, right? When we do an aneurysm, yeah. next we ask for. Yeah. Uh, Myocardial ischemia is common. Come on, in the ICU, what everything was the pay, the ICU? Um, it's the urine. Of course, everything we ask about MI before acute renal failure. Yeah, acute renal failure. So, well, uh, but uh, this one, uh, the clamping time was ten minutes only, and infrarenal. You're talking about in general, uh, Yeah, yeah, we. we... <laughs> The, act, the most we see is renal failure. It's the most patient we see them. We get an acute renal failure, uh, temporary or permanent, you know? So mm. this is because not only because the clamping, we hypotension, blood transfusion, yeah. you know, he already hypotensive before he came, all this damage the kidney. So the kidney is the worst one. So the reason why the first thing we do, like we don't ask for cardiac enzyme next day. We ask for urine output. We never ask for cardiac enzymes unless the patient has a yeah. symptom. So really the most common is acute renal failure. So what, what next will be? Well, let's put them in order now. So acute renal failure. Next one, I agree with MI. MI. MI is the next. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm just- I think emboli is common also. Yeah, but how often you see it? I mean, how many aneurysm we did? How emboli we see it? I mean, it's not more than MI. It might be more because hypotensive and, you know, so he may have, especially old people get 
cardiac uh, ischemia. So I think MI will be the second after renal failure. Samir, Samir, can I make the comment? Yes, please. Yeah, because I used to work in cardiovascular department. We used to deal with ruptured aneurysm quite often. Mm -hmm. And because we used to have a cardiac anesthesia with us, we used to do the transesophageal echo uh, quite often as well. It's not a must, obviously, but, you know, the research and stuff like that. And I've seen on my eyes the, 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 the images of the transesophageal echo immediately after declamping, because declamping is actually the most stressful. It's not the clamping itself. Clamping itself simulates the, the centralization of the circulation. So it's not a big deal. The big deal is when you open your clamp. Yeah, and that's, that's actually the momentum of the highest stress for the, for the myocardium. And I've seen the heart working first two, three bites with almost empty uh, chambers. It's, uh, the heart is getting crazy at that, at that point. So when the, the MI is definitely the second one and it's, and it's usually happening with, with the declamping and I advise you, uh, take, take your time with declamping. It's, it's, really, it's really very beneficial for the patient to take your time and declamp over like one, two minutes like opening the clamp very, very, you know, easily. It's not usually easy for, for the surgeon because you are stressed, you want to get out with the patient and stuff like that. But the critical moment is a declamping. That's the common. I agree with that, uh, Martin. I do, I usually partially, I just clamp it, you know, I open like maybe one clip of the- Yeah, I do the same, I do the same. Like, uh, slowly, and talk to the anesthesia. I'm mostly important to talk to the anesthesia. Anytime you the partial drop, then I clamp again. Give him more time to fill up the patient. Then I slowly I open my clamp and then I watch the pressure. If it drop again, then I'll stop. You know, if pressure is fine, then I go slowly. But the worst thing, as you said, just open the clamp and suddenly the anesthesia has no pressure, you know? And then you can see the heart start dancing. I agree yeah, with that, that. That's what is happening. That's what is happening. Even the arrhythmias are happening at this point. Yes. So be, be careful. Be, you are very enthusiastic because you are happy. It might be over, over soon. But they, especially the distal part, you know, because it's a, usually it's a tube graft, and when you when you fi when you finalize the distal anastomosis, you are happy and you want to see if there is no bleeding. But take your time, go, you know, step by step, and take like two, three, four, five minutes to just open the clamp completely. And if the anesthesia is having an issue, is the hypertension, just you know, you can close the tube graft with your hand as well, and give them time especially the first couple of beats when you open it. Don't open it abruptly yeah, because the heart is having no volume. There is no volume getting, you know, and because you open a huge afterload and be careful with that. That's correct. The other thing I'd like to get here from you guys is that the most really things I said, acute renal failure. I usually, when I clamp the aorta, I always give manitone, you know? Uh, for some reason, I think it decreases your chance of renal failure. Do you do that? Do you give manitol routinely or no? Azim and uh, Martin? No, I don't. No, I don't. No, I, don't, I, do don't. I don't actually. I, I do it like routinely. And I don't know, for some reason, I learned that it helps. So I don't know. Maybe we should look for it and see. I, 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 I think it's. I think it's 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 very good uh, according to our experience in the thoracic uh, aorto abdominal uh, replacement. But here, um, I think the problem here with the team, I don't have in the most of cases, I don't have uh, experience team from the anesthes from my colleagues in the in this case. So uh, for this matter, I try to be. Um, also um, at the level um, of only of uh, of uh, of uh, minimal uh, medication uh, um, giving uh, and i will uh, uh, give an, uh, any i will not uh, order to give any many tool okay all right um i think almost uh, done uh, what the rest is not to have creatinine i think just tell us what happened after that let's then uh, eventually replace <laughs> Dialysis. Next year he did one and he went home. Okay, I think we're done. Any question, guys, before we leave? We took too much. You know, uh, too long. Dr. Uh, Dr. Summer, yes. Regarding the previous question, the neck diameter, mm -hmm. isn't the endurance and zenith up to 32? Yeah, all of them uh, should be more, not more than 28, because the maximum for all of them is 36. So, uh, 
Metronics, uh, Coke, I think the largest they have 36. So you need That's like the diameter. The diameter of the graft, the EVAR. No, I mean the neck diameter. To accept the EVAR? Yeah. The maximum, I mean, if you want to, the IFU should be 28, but some people go with 30, 32, but it's not good. You know, some people go with 30, but really it should be 28 because many studies show that 28 to 32, you have high chance of uh, complication, type one endoleak and everything, you know? So it's better okay. your neck to be less than 28. Okay, thanks. Welcome. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. It was a nice session. We enjoyed it, and we'll see you hopefully next week. Thank you, Samir. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice evening. Thanks, Hazard. Thank you, everyone. Bye.